Australia, New Zealand. Well, good day, good evening, good morning, good whatever, wherever you are joining us here in the States in the time zones on October 31st, the hallowed day of Halloween. I'm so very, very glad to have you joining us for today's special edition of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. It's our weekly reading, but today it's our Halloween holiday live poetry costume party. Open mic with today's featured poets, Cindy Beach and Claire Kelly. They're gonna start us off with their poetic tales of things connected to the spirits of Halloween. And then we'll follow with your poems live on the open mic. I'm your host, Sandy Yanone. I'm the author of Boats for Women from Salmon Poetry. And we are in for a spectacular reading of poetry tricks and treats this afternoon, or as I said, evening, wherever you are in the time zones and uh, through, through time and space. I want to say thank you so much to those of you joining us here live in our Zoom poetry studio, uh, particularly and costumed, I might add. Hmm, fabulous. We should have a costume party every week. <laughs> and to those watching us live on Facebook, and of course, hello to those of you watching us past live either on our Facebook or YouTube recordings later on. Well, since March, 2020, we've brought you poetry weekly from around the world as part of our international intergenerational and intersectional Facebook poetry group, Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Before I turn to our Halloween features, I wanna give a round of gratitude for our new book showcase readers of last week. Uh, I, hope, I hope if you weren't with us live that you've had a chance to listen to the incredible showcase from Elizabeth Levinson, Karen Poppy, Ashley M. Jones, and Judith Kerman. Their readings were truly riveting. And again, a reminder, you can head to our YouTube or Facebook pages to watch or rewatch this that incredible reading. Well, now let's turn to today's incredible reading here on Halloween. First joining us today is Cindy Veach, reading in part from her latest collection, Her Kind, which just this week was featured as a fall read from the Academy of American Poets. Um, I always love when there's the synchronicity of we've got the, we you know, we have the poet ready to come and join us. And then we find out some amazing news and they're on the program. So directly from uh, that wonderful, wonderful news, uh, we're going to be hearing from Cindy Beach. And here's a little bit more about Cindy. Cindy's, as I mentioned, most recent book is Her Kind from Kevin Carey Press. She's also the author of Gloved Against Blood, also from Common Carey Press, which was named a finalist for the Patterson Poetry Prize and a must read by the Massachusetts Center for the Book, as well as please do check out her chapbook, Innocence from Nix's Mate. Oh, I have a, I have a copy of that chapbook. It's the, it, was the, it was one of the first things I read of yours and I can't express enough <clears throat> how great that chapbook is. So Cindy's poems have appeared in the Academy of American Poets Poem a Day, Anyi, Michigan Quarterly Review, Poet Lore, and Salamander, among many, many others. 
She's the recipient of the Philip Booth Poetry Prize and the Samuel Allen Washington Prize and is also co-poetry editor of the, of the true, uh, one of the really great journals here, um, Mom Egg Review. It's such a pleasure to welcome Cindy to the program. Thank you. We're so looking forward to hearing the poetry. Thank you, Sandy. Um, that was really um, a wonderful introduction and happy Halloween, everybody. Um, I'm grateful to be here and looking forward to um, Claire's reading and all of the open mic. So as Sandy said, I'm gonna to read today from my new book, Her Kind, which is themed around the Salem witch trials. So I'll just share a little bit about the background for this book. Um, in 2016, after living in the Salem area for over 20 years, I stumbled on the Salem Witch Trials Memorial, which is kind of off an alley. It's, it's not easily found. Um, up until that point, I had succumbed to the witch kitch narrative of modern day Salem. But for some reason on that day in that place, I was changed. I decided to write a poem about each of the 20 victims and this became the chat book that Sandy mentioned. At the same time, I was experiencing the end of a long marriage and Donald Trump had been elected president. In my mind, I connected these events with the witch trials and in particular with the female victims which are represented in her kind. So I'll read some of the witchier poems today from, from the book. I witch. So what if I woke up changed? It's not like I'm a wild hog or some evil thing, not a real hog that follows you home, jumps into the window, a monkey with cock's feet, with claws. Don't believe what my accuser says or believe it. The fact is my divorce attorney's building sits on the site of the prison where they kept the accused in chains in 1692. I came there with a silk scarf worn loosely at the neck, borders looped with colored thread, he came with daisies, dark chocolate, and proclaimed, my wife came towards me and found fault with me. Downstairs in the dungeon, they chained us to the walls to keep our spirits from escaping in the likeness of a bird. This next poem is titled Spectral Evidence. And that was a type of testimony in which a witness could claim that the accused had appeared to them and did them harm in a dream or a vision. And this was allowed in the courts um, during the Salem witch trials. <clears throat> Spectral evidence. Because she said she saw, and therefore, these pinholes in her skin on one arm to be exact, look how they crisscross, make a doily of the flesh. And because she said she saw, you, not you, take a small pin from your pocket, a straight pin with a flat head. And because she said it was, it was. Therefore you, therefore not a dream, puncturing each pore, you in the flesh, not flesh, with a common pin. Apparition. A charm of starlings at nightfall, a whorl of leaves or runes of glass in a kaleidoscope, divining a squall of starlings at nightfall, shape-shifting cauldron of wings, pall of specters swirling on mass, a spell of starlings at nightfall, a whorl of leaves or runes of glass. Um, this is one of the victim poems. Um, this is about Rebe Rebecca Nurse, who was hanged on July 19, 1692. Rebecca Nurse of the Accused. At first the jury returned not guilty, to which the judge said, retire and reconsider the not. After all, she had not answered the question she had not heard, guilty of being hard of hearing, maybe mouthing 
what? Guilty of having a temper, arguing with neighbors. Guilty too of piety, 39 attesting to her deep devotion. Still, the afflicted swore it was her apparition that did the pinchings and prickings of their flesh. And in court, when she raised her arms, the afflicted raised their arms. And when she inclined her head, the afflicted inclined their heads. Um, <clears throat> this poem is titled, Umensi Triggers Witch Hunt. So umensi is divination by egg. It's a reading or scrying of the shapes that a separated egg white forms when it's dropped into hot water. And one theory suggests that this is what triggered the events that occurred in, in Salem. Umensi triggers witch hunt. Because albumin in water shapeshifts, becomes bells, fingers, spires, becomes omen, a future husband, his occupation, but also unexpectedly, a specter in the likeness of a coffin, a sign of diabolical molestation. Elizabeth and Abigail fell into fits, barking like dogs, complaining, invisible spirits were pinching them, therefore the afflicted, therefore the accused. This is another victim poem, and this is um, about Martha Carrier, who was hanged on August 19, 1692. Trump has called the investigation a witch hunt 84 times. They said she brought smallpox to Andover. They said she killed her father and brother, making her a queen in hell, AKA landowner. Neighbors testified it was none other than Goody Carrier who haunted them at night. They said she bit Sue Sheldon, threatening to cut her throat because she wanted her to sign the book. She stuck a, she stuck a pin in Dumb and Putnam, killed Samuel Preston's cow for being very lusty. And there was that devil man whispering in her ear. Somehow she caused the death of Alan Toothacre's cat. For these complaints, though each one was a lie, she was condemned by the grace of God to die. This uh, next poem is a found poem. <clears throat> Reasons you might have been accused of being a witch in 1692. You are a woman. You are middle-aged. You have an extra nipple, mole, freckle, or basically any mark on your body you stumble over your words. You have an extra nipple, mole, freckle. When asked to say a prayer, you stumble over the words. You're married, but don't have children. When asked to say a prayer, you are the envy of other people. You are married, but don't have enough children. You associate with someone suspected of witchcraft. You are the envy of other people. You are perceived as bitchy. You associate with someone suspected of witchcraft your milk spoiled. You are perceived as bitchy. You are of low status, your milk spoiled, or anything vaguely negative that happened to or around you. You were of low status. You have any mark on your body, your milk spoiled. You were a woman, you are middle-aged. Um, so there's a few poems in the book that referred to some mythological creatures. And this one is Kiki Mora. She was a female house spirit said to attach herself to a particular house and to disturb the inhabitants and in particular the male inhabitants. I, Kiki Mora. The spider first classified the year I wed. Spider smaller than a speck of straw. Spider of the bog, of swamp, wetland, marsh, quagmire, a mere wisp of khaki shaft, of hair, a sphinx moth, night butterfly, invisible wraith who slips through the keyhole after dark, both beautiful and ugly, whiny, glass half empty, noisemaker, dish breaker, home wrecker, wet footprints across his heart. 
watching the news in my attorney's waiting room. There are burning Harry Potter books in Poland. It felt like magic when I gave him my hand. It was magic when I gave him my hand and the justice pronounced us husband and wife. I was pregnant and wanted to be his wife. They're live streaming the bonfire of books, priests and altar boys burning wicked books. In my country, divorce is legal and books about magic aren't evil. But if I file for divorce, I'm a bitch. But if I file for divorce, I'm a witch. There doesn't need to be a good reason. There doesn't need to be a reason. They're burning Harry Potter books in Poland. So two more poems. Um, this next poem um, is titled Gallows Project Team Verifies Site of Salem Witch Trial Hangings. So in 2016, after centuries really of conflicting beliefs on where the hangings took place, the actual site was verified um, by research based on um, witness references in, in the uh, trial papers, some maps from that period and some technology that had never been available before and it was sonar technology. Um, okay, Gallo's project team verifies site of Salem witch trial hangings near the stoplight by the big Walgreens. Over to the right, see that rock ledge where it's dark, those bare oak trees? Near the stoplight by the big Walgreens and the Dunkin' Donuts full of randy teens. Now we know it's not where legend said, but near the stoplight by the big Walgreens, over to the right, that rock ledge. And the last poem, I Hakati. She was the Greek goddess of crossroads. She ruled over the night, magic, and places where three roads meet. She's one of my favorites. I Hakati. Between queen, liminal sorceress, crossroads guardian, story of my life. Who are you today, my ex would taunt. More than just a Gemini. A trimorphous, human form in triplicate. Birth, love, death. Maiden, mother, crone. Moon, earth, underworld. I'll take triplicity over duplicity any day. Three heads are better. Even if one has to be a dog, a bitch. Dog, dog, dog. Dog, serpent, horse. Dog, cow, boar. Even if it means I am witch. That old crone at the cauldron, stirring willows, dark yew, blackthorn. It took a torch, a key, a dagger to cut away a past. It took 30 years. It took all three of me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I forgot to hold up the book, but this is it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cindy. The book, let's hold it up. Well, again, <laughs> is her kind. A uh, reminder that these poems are uh, in 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 an in invocation to the history of um, uh, the Salem witch trials. Of men, among many other threads of contemporary uh, of contemporary issues related to the, sp the speaker's personal life as well as uh, as well as the political climate of American politics. So uh, it is quite a constellation and I, I, I true I, I, I am a, a true aficionado of when we when we weave in, that when we weave in the deep historical and particularly um, give voice to the stories of, um, of, 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 of women who have been uh, truly victimized, uh, you know, by, as things were being mentioned in the chat, um, by, 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 the, by the patriarchal uh, uh, injustices of, 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 
of society, uh, particularly at that time. And what a, a what a way to remind us that there, there's so many myths about the Salem witch trials. And I love how you really bring them to the um, to the forefront and just open and and bring them wide open by having them juxtaposed to the contemporary ways that um, that the that um, that these misnamings and uh, misappropriations continue to perpetuate themselves throughout um, throughout time. Thank you very, very much. Uh, and again, uh, the book is her kind. We'll be posting um, we'll be also posting to Facebook a link um, to make sure that you can pick up this that's a new, very new collection from Coven Carey Press. Thank you so much, Cindy. And thank just, you all. Thank wow. You. Wow. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for giving me this forum because there were never any witches really in Salem, Massachusetts. That's, so we, we, we have fun today, but it's important to remember that. So that is thank absolutely you. Thank you. a core truth, <laughs> a core truth if you studied the, yeah, absolutely. Well, Folks, joining us next in our feature before we go to the open mic and hear what your contributions are on our Halloween reading is Claire Kelly. And Claire joined us just last month, really with a preview of some of, of today's poems. Um, these are just truly remarkable um, renderings of if you can if you can imagine it if you haven't heard them uh, and the intersection the, the the interweaving of the tropes of horror films and how that has affected um, feminist how, and how and, and how and how she interprets these and turns them into more feminist narratives to uh, to rewrite the narratives of the horror flick. It's it's very uh, it's it's just so incredible, and I think you will also appreciate the pairing with Cindy's poems in thinking about um, you know how absolutely what horror films did is what in real life happened also at the Salem witch trials. So same things are kind of similar things are happening um, in terms of, of naming and renaming. And so we're gonna get to see another take on this from Claire Kelly's truly amazing poems. Um, Claire has written two poetry collections, One Thing Then Another and Maunder. And her poems have appeared in literary journals all across Canada. And as I mentioned, have recently focused on horror films from a, fe from a feminist perspective, as well as the apocalyptic nothingness that is becoming the certain future of earthlings. She does this with great humor, however. Claire. You gotta laugh. <laughs> you gotta laugh. You gotta laugh. Claire lives and writes on Treaty 6 territory in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. We're so, so very happy to have you back with us so soon and to be sharing these just truly unique poems with our audience here on Halloween. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, thank you for having me again. I'm uh, gonna overstay my welcome. Uh <laughs> I, um, and it was so, I was looking at Cindy's bio today and I saw her kind. It's the only poem I've ever successfully memorized, the Anne Sexton poem. And I had been working on a horror novel called Her Kind that I gave up on because it just doesn't feel like it belongs to the new normal. I'm starting a new new horror novel, but like, uh, yeah. So I'm like, oh, all this uh, synchronicity, which is, uh, feels witchy too. <laughs> I'm actually going to read um, just two poems from my uh, one thing than another because they do intersect with intersect with horror 
movies. Um, basically, this collection is about moving from the east, like from Fredericton, New Brunswick, so east coast of Canada, um, the poorest province to Alberta, which at the time was the richest province in Canada, and it's, um, it's, it's a western province, and um, sort of the, the juxtaposition. And one thing that I noticed, the weather is very, very different. So going from a wet place to a dry place that through climate crisis is going to be even drier as the glaciers melt that give us our water to drink. Um, so these poems sort of look at desertification. Um, and I looked at films set in the desert for the images and the titles of the poems. So the first poem, uh, the movie, and these are the two I've picked are horror poems, horror, horror movies. Uh, them from 1984, 1954, starting out well. <laughs> Spits all that's holding me together. Give me a small town, not a rat bit city scared by scarcity. Know your neighbor, her weakness, his hiding spots, whether you could see him thrown and still trust him. Blood may be thicker than water, but it's thinner than sand rain pummeled to silt. In a pinch, you can build a house with that. Don't you go at it like a feral cat. Your hoard? Huh. There's hordes can tear through the side of a trailer like a kid through caramel. That noise? A cricket with a bullhorn. A yodeler trapped in a mine shaft. The wind never stops only kicks up when the clockwork gale dances like a drunk widow, shows her knickers, tells the whole lot of us to suck her marbles. Wish you were stone deaf like that one cousin of yours? That's ears down the silliest thing I ever half heard. Clean that grit from your canals and who knows what'll slip past bikining. Case in point, Last week, gossip fluttered mouth to ear, ear to mouth, our proverbial grapevine sprouting a ripe gobbet. That there's old Randall dead in a cellar, hiding from the dust he became. Around him, all these unshared cans, beans, 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 tuna and smoked oysters, seltzer water going flat in plastic. But damn, them stacks of sugar stacked to the rafters. We all found ourselves scurrying like ants, like giant reckless ants. Mandible man, I see your mouth watering enough to puddle around your shoes. Bet you that tonight your dreams are of blood that's sweeter and wetter than the stories of Texans are large. If you haven't seen them, <laughs> It's about radioactive ants that grow to a great size. <laughs> it's got one of the creepiest little kid moments in, in like an older horror film too, right up there with the bad seed. So the next one is one of the films that gave me recurring nightmares as a child. Even though I saw Night of the Living Dead when I was five, it wasn't that, it was Tremors. <laughs> We don't do anything right now. Two minutes to bolt. Step lizard light through the thin vibrations. My mother said don't, but that didn't help. So take time to pogo along the dune street, up and down like a Western city's prospects. Here we're all a ghost town waiting to sun bleach. Crack no name denim. Uneven bangs obscuring our eyes. Gotta keep that sun bitch out somehow. Never know what we'll see when our veins are beef jerky hung on a phone pole. There used to be a river run through here. Hey, what plan can you enact when the ground is full of wet mouths, when you dream of wet mouths, and those mouths stink like a scared dead polecat? With any luck, a rocky outcropping can be salvation. The only moisture is that which is sheathed in goatskin. 
canyonize. What did they eat before we got stuck here? Greens, he replies, all the greens. And that, yeah, that, uh, my collection came out a while back. <laughs> Time is weird in the pandemic. I can't keep track of it. Um, this book came out uh, almost a year ago, just past a year ago. I don't want to think about time. Um, it's another final girl. Yeah, I'm looking at horror movies. Um, I'm going to read first the opening poem. Um, I grew up in the suburbs of Toronto, and there's so much suburban horror. Like, it's just such a place where they sat. And I think it's because we think of suburbia as someplace that's neat and orderly. And that's a fun place to make horror happen. <laughs> like the neater and tidier the place, the funner to knock it over. These kids are all right, but they are out to get you. So easy to get lost in. Our neighborhood had four house designs used in rotation. Stepford houses, welcoming and unseeming, welcoming and seemingly safe. Garage on right with window, garage on right, no window, garage on left with window, garage on left, no window. Everyone took to pickiness to decide what who was better than what who. Respected owners of pie shaped lots, interlocking bricked rockways, second bathroom plumbing hookups in basements, precise eyes gauging as if to crack the case of a ritual slaying. Sprinkler system or hose unfurling, push mower or riding. When I met a friend of a friend who lived a street over, he told me one of the houses on my tiny crescent was cursed. His house had garage right with window, so did mine. A place caught fire there, he said. I knew that the flames had been doused before any structural damage, just water and smoke an acrid wraith smell that always makes my toes curl. My house, cursed. When I was five, I told the other kids that the place next door, with its overgrown spruce trees and burnt out light bulbs, was haunted. The ghosts tell me things, I fibbed, hoping through boredom that they would believe me. And they did until I stretched the yarn too far that the spirits wanted my friends to give me their sweetly gotten Halloween treats, the good stuff, mini chip bags and chocolate bars, not a single candy corn or pasty rocket cylinder. No one bought it, my career as a medium over, though a stubborn rumor of the house specters did last through high school. Of course, gossip climbed the street lights and we all basked in it. Of course, there's a girl the parents nicknamed Sneaky Margaret, whose tricks were better than mine, who charmed us into burying our junk dollar store jewelry in her backyard. She kept the map, had her own spade, and two stunning older sisters egging her on in whispered Croatian. Of course, we spread curses like salt in winter and need ghost stories. We are children of humans. It was all that kept us from haunting every commuter, from not boring ourselves to death and any undeadness beyond, or plucking the pink-laden heads of peonies from mischief spell after mirthful mischief spell. So um, I will say Sneaky Margaret's older sister was the babysitter who let, a, let me at five pick out Night of the Living Dead to watch while my parents were away. So yeah, uh, here, here's to that family because who knows what kind of horror journey I would have been on without it, without them. Um, I read this poem last time. It's the title poem of the collection, but because this poem was so like partially inspired by the Halloween movie series, um, especially the first one, um, I, I felt I needed to read it. Um, so it's another final girl. A final girl is a uh, film theory trope uh, made by Carol J. Clover in her lovely titled 
uh, theory book, Men, Women, and Chainsaws. And it looks at slasher flicks. So content warning, this is about slasher flicks. There will be some violence in it. Or, yeah. Another final girl. Survival is not enough. Rain plummet, a shirt ripped just so, dirtied and bloodied just so, not enough. You owe me more. I want my time back, what I've been scorched through, this gore thick TikTok carnage. And every second I'll spend tenderly studying spluttering breath, toweling away adrenaline rank sweat. Tell me, what's it like to feel calm in a crowd, to feel safe at home with the curtains open? This healing could take years, a lifetime. I know it's taken a lot from me. Don't you dare say I'm overreacting. No, I am not screaming at you. I am screaming for me because these sensors are raw, flickering like overhead lights in that hallway I run through again and again. I remember losing my shoes. I remember falling on repeat, on repeat, on repeat, but getting up. I demand more. The world to hold accountable the wrecking I am reckoning with. This is not rebirth. It is not forgetting. I am more than just getting out alive. It's the Halloween movie is amazing. <laughs> I'm gonna say <laughs> big vote up for that movie. It uh I love Jamie Lee Curtis. So yeah, that's uh, introducing me to Jamie Lee Curtis. I appreciate <laughs> Um, It's a ghost poem, the passive aggressive poltergeist. Thought you were my shadow, plumping vapor into a density I could touch. Following me so I'm not alone among strangers, occasionally not so friendly creaking the cupboards, an eerie screech, slapping down the toilet seat just as I drift to sleep. I jump the same way as when an ax falls, aimed through whatever tree is chosen. The one time I chopped wood to kidling, I learned that if you aim to hit the log, the blade glances off as if the wood shrugged. Aim through as though trying to hurt the ground and the log splits like a belly laugh. I don't know why I'm telling this or to whom, just that lately the days drift into dryness and each morning my mouth feels crammed with moths, their powder scattered on my tongue. Silly thing, have you been luring them into my sleeping open jaws with a glowing orb? Like we're part of the same anglerfish, I can't get rid of you. This indirectness is getting us everywhere. So last poem I'm going to read is uh, last poem in the book. Um, so yeah, there's a content warning for this as well. Um, more about what it implies than necessarily what it says, but uh, it deals with a genre of horror film that I got kind of fascinated with. Um, they're rape revenge movies. Um, and there's, there's quite a few of them. And the ones that work for me are the ones where the person who's, who experiences the pain gets the revenge. There's ones where like that person doesn't get to get the revenge. People get the revenge for her and, and not they don't work for me they just don't um but yeah this this is also about horses who don't like me <laughs> nightmare for nightmare's sake horses have never taken a shine to me they take a nip out of me and head to the farthest fence even when i was little i didn't give off zen bundle of nerves like twigs to be burnt Potential, pent up, 
energy like pulsar, like muscle spasm charging up my neck to the brain box. Never sure of what a horse's body language meant, their beauty aisle eyelashes, long legs, legs that seem insufficient to carry that solid torso, girth that has held us humans up for so long. But I was once allowed to see two mares just after they gave birth, both rescues from the same terrible place, a breeding factory in Saskatchewan, one so horror stricken and protective of her foal, so many having been taken away, that she uses her still too skinny body to shield him from our eyes. The other, bolder and stronger, strength from I don't know where, lets her newborn approach where we all cluster, yet won't let us touch what's hers. That night I dream I'm a nightmare that delivers revenge for mares. I'm spitting on your human graves. I'm last horse on the left, ready to bloody the pastures, to lash out with all my limbs, cathartic cart horse, Clydesdale with hooves as heavy as surviving, to haul and haul and haul. Oh, I will gallop beyond each end credit and damn well live. Thank you. <laughs> absolutely spectacular i knew this pairing of you claire and cindy would just be the most spectacular kickoff to this reading and really also um the way that that both that that both but that both you and cindy you know contextualize so much more than the the um the very surface trope of these stories of like the you know of of the horror like they go so much so much deeper to um to 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 really uh, contextualize complicate um what what become very what have become very common narratives either in film or in the culture as we've heard the the witch trials um uh, those stories be perpetuated but but not really told in their full truth and so i really appreciate what how both of you you know have 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 brought um have brought through poetry a, a much more uh a, a much richer rendering of what's really going on but behind what we think we're being either told to see or seeing on the screen um uh, and i also have to put in a very very quick thing about the bad seed what and an, an, that i can't remember the name of the lead the 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 girl who was the lead but what a performance that was in that film probably from the 50s if you've never seen that film Oh my gosh, what she does in that film. But again, that ending. Oh my God. You and I know what the how what the ending is. So thank you so much. Um, Claire Kelly, I've we've got the links to both the new uh, both the new co newest collections. Um, um, another final girl and her kind in the chat. I'll be putting it in uh, again. Uh, once we get started with the reading, I hope you'll pick these up. It's so important for us to support the poets. And now we're going to shift over to um, the live open mic. We have folks joining us from, I mean, literally all around, all around the globe for the open mic. And um, we were going, going to have 12 folks, but we've got 15 folks. We want to get 15 in. So I'm going to ask if folks can read to about three, three minutes if possible, uh, because we we like to we like to head to about a 90 minute reading for all of our purposes. Um, and that will allow us to get all 15 that have signed up um, in. The first three readers, we're gonna start with with um with our good friend, my salmon sister, uh, Janet McFadden and then Marcella Raymond and Sandy Clevin will be the first 
three up. Take it away, Janet, start us off. Thanks for being with us today. Oh, thank you. This is wonderful. This poem I'm going to read, I never thought of as a Halloween poem, but I realize I think it's appropriate. It's, it's um, I'm going to read um, two, and they're both in my upcoming um, book from Salmon. Um, this first one's called The Spoon Lullabies. It's in the current issue of Cranog, if I pronounce that right. It goes, The Spoon Lullabies. Make a mirror of a spoon and catch your image on its head mouth stretched open like a fish, fun house in the cereal bowl. Line spoons up like fishing lures, someone will be in love with them. Maybe I'll lick sugar crystals from their lips, poke spoons in my hair like knitting needles like my grandmother. Come, I will dole you out some baby food, some soup, some stew. A fork and spoon are married on the table, see them runcible about, spoon with forks teeth tuned to sweetness in deep woods someone is crooning up a honeymoon a crone ladles out the money and the baby howls do i belong here where is my mummy behind the carved oval door a closet in the closet a row of hooks and caught on one a woman in a mesh of spoons that jangle as she struggles Tied to her breast, a cuttlefish. Around her feet, a pool of honey in which the half moon is reflected. A gasp of recognition. Oh, crone, whose mirror is this? Whose face is this I see? My dearest heart, my sweetness. First, it was mine, then your mother's. Now it is yours, and baby is next. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Uh, okay, and then a, another um, short one, uh, which is called I Am Not the Story That Was Told and ties in with what people have been talking with uh, how women's experiences are negated by the culture, their memories negated, our good minds, our good perceptions negated. This is called I Am Not the Story That Was Told. To say I remember is to say I made it up, which is to say memory is not a hawk a ladder to climb on, a hook. It is not these gray eyes, one drilling inward like an auger, the other crazed glass unhinged from its stalk, which is to say I will deflect any advances, will sidestep the heat-seeking words, dance for anyone who cares to watch, swear to uphold family and nation, or pull down the billboard, the veil, the cyclone, I must not be found at the center of the crime scene, the kernel of desperation at the heart of the poem. Not even the double-bladed ax can excise me. How else can I avoid catastrophe? How does the house not go up in flames? Thank you. Oh, wow, fantastic. All those poems. Thank you so much. Janet, for starting us off today. Um, you, you all know me. I like to comment on everything, but I, I've got to keep us going along. So uh, in the open mic in particular. So I'm going to introduce uh, Marcella Raymond and Sandy Clevin will be following. Please, when you introduce yourself, let us know where you're joining us from. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Marcella Raymond, and I'm joining you from um, I'm joining you from South Dakota, uh, where it's where it's nice and chilly today. So it's a chilly Halloween here. Um, and I have two short poems. The first poem is a poem about uh, women as mermaids and how women become ghosts or how women can become ghosts. And the poem starts with a little epigraph um, from Anthony Doerr, Lugubrious Monsters. Lugubrious monsters made of sea foam, mermaids with fishy private parts, Anthony Doerr. You can't placate lugubrious monsters in their stubborn dismal drudgery. They refuse to be happy, satisfied, or even slightly less harumphy. 
who wouldn't be all sobs and misery to be only a wisp under a bed, a moan in a closet, a sudden nostalgic odor any open window can waft away. Lugubrious monsters come in many shapes, sirens, medusas, churls, pig women, norns, teenage girls, housewives, divorcees, grandmothers left in cold day rooms. Here by the sea, you want mermaids. You forget cloaca, that solitary fishy gate through which all things must pass, feces, urine, and your romantic misconceptions. And when she doesn't match the starlit fairy tale you imagine in bed, when the sheets are full of barnacles, the room smells like candles and squid ink, when she's run a line of slimy algae down your spine with fingers meant to gut fish, when you ask her to sing and she barks like a Kelpie, when sucker fish gasp and flop on your pillow, when she grins her pointy yellow teeth at you, when her barbed fins cut your legs to ribbons, how fast the lights come on, how fast you leave her high and dry. So who can blame lugubrious monsters for weeping sounds in the dark, for telltale odors, for hiding in closets behind the dust and myths. Thank you. Um, and this is a short poem called uh, Sonnet to My Vampire. It could be so much worse, you know, much worse than falling for a vampire the rogue undead. Sure, he's haughty with his thick foreign verse and obsessive lust for breathing down my neck, that coppery breath. If he's awake, he's hungry, never satisfied, snores, keeps odd hours. And now I spend my own lifeless sprees crammed in a box beside my dank and dour creature, dead to the world. He's turned me lazy, yes, but these are trifles that pale, you know, the cape, the widow's peak, the bloody mess, if you'll just contemplate. He's been loving women from the start, and he's honed it to a perfect ancient art. Thank you. Fabulous. So glad. So great to have you with us today, Marcella. Thanks for coming out. Oh, it's great to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Glad to you. <laughs> we move along next to, oh, she's got the glasses. <laughs> Love it. She's got to take them off. <laughs> <laughs> Sandy Clevin, followed by Elham Mohammadi. Thank you. I, um, looked through my collection Defiant Street for something spooky, and I think I have found it. It's a long poem. I'm only going to read one. Uh, and it's in persona. Uh, some character like I look like is speaking to somebody else, maybe to me. Uh, Seculae secularum. When I breathe like this, put your hand here beneath the joining bones. Feel the hum of vestal rhythms, the rum of reckless plots. Slake the drip of my disorder. Watch the poet wince. The story starts right here. Come close. I want to tell you everything. Don't listen to clacking birds with narrow beaks, silent runners passing stakes. They splay their knees at the ratchet of eternity. I climbed that tree. I ate the bitter orange. I took the cure. We will light a fire soon. Don't be afraid. When shadow people loom and swoop, don't flinch. 
There is not a single spirit who can light a candle and none can take an ax to wood. No, listen, really. My foot is on the sparrow. His bones could snap like twigs. He rests beneath my instep, a perfect fit. I am forever covering a sparrow with my foot. No, listen. Long ago, there was lore, bound in paste, peeling from walls, a ring around a single night, grim as the fiddler's moon. There were invectives, postulates, and as before, pretense. I had no plum. I am shrill and light with lack. I was deprived of butter. Potter's luck is lost. I did not find brim rock. I have been publicly thrown and scattered. Now death shames me. Quiver here, my footman, my finery, my fig. If I shiver, drown me in tea. Bring aromas from the garden to hearten me. Don't speak, let it go. Take my hand to your throat. Swallow hard my red tail, my skipper. Bees buzz in your ears. Light flicker bends. Hope rises like a garden hose. Hope rises like the warm worm you touch in your pants. Hope rattles like a tool shed. Hope hides the sparrow. Say, it's not here, never here. When doubt rises like the oyster moon, and fury unsettles your bed. Pray to be battle soft. Pray to be clay in an orphan's hand. Pray to be read and rendered. Pray to be held in the mouth like meal. Pray to be anointed. When the cast stone doubles your temptation, when sin shines from the moonlit breast of a timid girl and your hand strays, pray to be touched and turned. Pray naked and nimble. Pray new prayers. Pray songs. Embrace this mantle, this call, this fond elemental, this shim, this grin you were named before your birth. Embrace the flute, the menace of amnesty, the long walk on one foot. Despair the cynic's leering crust. Bend to this pen, my hesitant, or I swear, I will smear this festering veil, this sparrowing, farrowing rookery, this godsend, this sniffery, this dimwit tail. I will smear it like a cave painting and send it up in dust. Oblivion chokes on your name. Without your wide heart, we are done. Fool's oil weeps down your brow. You belong to this. Was it scary? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> very ominous, very ominous. Fantastic, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sandy. Oh my God, it's so great. And uh, my hat off to you this, this, this good day. Well, next, we have joining us, it's the first time joining us on the, uh, at Cultivating Voices. I want to welcome uh, Elham Hamadi. It's so, Hamadi, it's so great to have you with us. Hi. We can hear you beautifully. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. I am so happy I'm here with you and Pues. My poem is uh, The Trees Walk, yeah? The trees walk at night and will release shadows and lights into my heart without the sound of a broomstick breaking the path of leaves. It makes the space sick the trees walk at night and humans are mysteriously planted in footsteps of trees. Their heads bob in the dark 
without a red light stop them, without the pedestrian lines putting human's leg in a cage, the night walks recklessly inside me along the yellow line. Thanks. Just beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you. I look forward to Thank you, you so much. being with us many, many more times in the future. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank <laughs> you. Sorry, I cannot speak English well. Sorry. No. So all is all is well. Thank you. Next, we have Thank you so the Artful Dodger, Harvey Sauce. Hello, Harvey. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, now let's see if I can find the phone. I, I have two poems, and if I have another 20 or 30 seconds at the end, uh, please let me know. Um, it, the third one is about misogyny. So uh, this one is called, it was such a pretty face he had until they coshed him ugly. Coshed means to hit with a, a blunt object, such as for instance, the butt of a gun. The cyclist who found him at first thought he was a scarecrow tied to a fence and left to die. Not knowing his name, Matthew Shepard or his species or his age, not quite 22, only the blood was real. The blood is always real. And the skull fracture that might have served as a bird feeder had he hung about any longer, all askew, almost unrecognizable as human, tortured, beaten, gender free, whipped into a smoothie by the cowboy booted swaggerers who gave him a lift. Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson of nearby Laramie, fellows of little fellowship with him or with humans generally, shifting the clutch away from neutral into ill intention, a queer killing mechanism kicking in. Perhaps his wounds dripped HIV on those straights who beat him as a last defense against the hate they hit him with, he had it, the HIV. Their lawyers, of course, would later claim justification, a robbery gone wrong, saying this swishy hitchhiker had come on to them that Matthew Shepard's hand touched the knee deliberately, not inadvertently, that their clients, good old boys, went queer crazy, as anyone might, whose knee was brushed by a faggot. An acceptable term of reference in 1998 among Marlboro men. They call Wyoming the equality state, not much of a nickname. Not so billboard terrific as the big sky state of Montana next door, showing little broke back mountain imagination, somewhat lacking for a license plate. Still, the murder of Matthew Shepard caught our attention and held it. Meet the press and a prairie home companion wanted to know, as did we all when the former altar boy, a thin blonde, reportedly tender hearted and kind, was left to die left hanging there as a present day Ece homo, where pray tell was the equality, the companionship in that. Two life sentences consecutive the killers got, the bludgeoner McKinney without any hope of parole in a penitentiary walled and windowed and wide as a cornfield where they couldn't be, wouldn't be strung up as Matthew was to be picked apart by crows. Second one is uh, another avian-ish poem. Wild thing, I think I love you. Maybe it was one kindred spirit recognizing another, the Northern goshawk seeing in me a sort of gone to ground Hawkeye character, undomesticated as he was, though of a less enduring nature, living an outdoors life yet unable to put down roots. Perhaps that's why he let me feed him mice from my kitchen being in no short supply, nor trapped rabbits that will never trouble a garden again. Once, I remember, he took a live mouse from my hand, 
while I held the creature by its tail, holding steady as an artist's model, showing no fear my newfound friend could have sensed and jumped on, claws and beak rending flesh beyond the healing properties of unguents and band-aids. If not quite a confidant during a short stay recalibration of getting myself straight, then certainly a sometime companion who might perch on the peak roof of my rental cabin several times a week, more quietly than any provincial theater group's reprise of Fiddler on the Roof, a Tevier more interested in mice than money, pray than prayer. From his favorite spot next to an unmoving weather vane, likely not oiled in this century, he watched me chop wood and stack it, withdraw captured rabbits from cages to be shared out for supper dining al fresco even in the worst weather. I didn't feed him clearly male every time I saw him, not wanting him to become too dependent on my handouts, lose those sharp-eyed hunting skills he would continue to need when I was gone. It was an understanding that we had, nothing of the broke back mountain sort, nothing Freudian about it, just a couple of wild things, sometimes sharing a meal in the deep woods of Maine. Occasionally in a role reversal, he would bring me some bird he had caught, knifed out of the sky, a lesser aerialist on the circus food chain, dropping it near me as if repaying a debt, as a cat might. I would make a show of accepting it gratefully, proudly marching the dead thing into the house where I coffined it in an appropriately sized Ziploc to be buried after he had flown away, no disrespect intended or taken. In this manner, we passed several months together while I searched for my voice and he grew into his feathers, yellow eyes reflecting his adolescence, crow killer rehearsing the part of winged assassin, weirdling hatched as from the mind of Stephen King. The raptor wasn't there to see me go, fully fledged by then and probably out hunting. For my part, I had achieved some small measure of wilderness self-sufficiency, having learned from his example how to tear the still beating heart out of a living thing. Do I have uh, 20 so or so seconds left to do another one or not? Anybody there? Yeah, we should probably go on. Sorry, Harvey. I'm trying to That's get fine. a lot of people in. Thank no, you. I, I understand full well. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, you, you understand. Sure. Sure <laughs> Thank do. you. I'm so glad to have you here today. As always. And love joining the, the tap hut. <laughs> <laughs> and joining us next is Patricia uh, Kerrigan. Hello. And Hi. remember, please, folks, three minutes. And okay, I'm gonna make uh, share chance. where you're joining us from. Brooklyn, New York, Har like Harvey, Brownstone Poets. Okay, let me just shut up and read. <laughs> inbox sky. You rise into the inbox sky entwined with flames and smoke. Passion searches the ruins, gathers your ashes inside a metal box. Blueprints of bone and flesh live in ash. Memories and thoughts linger in scent. My perpetual flame needs you more than ever. I open that box, eat the gray dust that was you. Ingest your topaz eyes, chestnut hair, hands and lips that knew mine. Merge with your body, say I'm sorry. Wait for comfort and advice. Offer my ashes in return. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Solitude, thank you. Solitude, one of my jazz poems, Billy Holiday. Solitude plays film noir, the haute couture wears despair like satin pumps. She is Melanie Dietrich, elegant black feathers cast a veil across her face. Solitude walks beside me, extends in sunlight, moves inward at night. She is like me, can't survive without mutual support. She sits beside me, explains that not all firestones are alike. That dark rainbows come in various shades of lies and abuse. Billie Holiday, 
sings a silent prayer for you to return. The stillness of the room collides with the one within, a storm brews between the past and the present, and I going crazy, hearing voices hum as memories haunt the night. This room is not the same, and the gap between logic and absurdity makes this room smaller than it is. And a quick little haiku. Halloween party. Humans wear kitty costumes. Cat hides under bed. Halloween party. Humans wear kitty costumes. Cat hides under bed. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Oh my gosh, I love the haiku. Cat hiding under bed. Black cat hiding under bed. Next we have next we have Kate Wegerson. Be sure to tell us where you're from. And three minutes, please. Hello. Ooh. Hello. I'm, I'm here in Colorado. And this is the first time I've listened to Cultivating Voices without my notebook and my pen. So the student has come to full circle to do listening. As I did for 35 years running a store, the door was open for anyone that would come in. And I treasured my empathic ability to greet people on the level they were at. And it was a wonderful time of learning how to be amongst the public. And today I have a poem that when I found it, I couldn't believe I had written it. And I was reading on quintessential radio and my daughter came from the other room and left me a note and said, mom, that's my favorite poem. Where is it from? And I want to be on that radio show. So today, for all the listening to everyone's hearts and everyone's thoughts, as we change the season from the moon and the fog in the northern hemisphere that always comes in with rain and change of weather and our change of attitude to continue to be empathic to others. The fox and the soul of a woman. Lone fox in my yard stopped in its tracks, 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 listening. Thoughts spelled out in code. No interruption. Night fox and a woman's soul each late for the dawn, watching the clouds sail, 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 listening in silence. Snowflakes fall gently, dark sky, stars ascend, heaven sent. How will I know you long ago memory now? Fox listened to my thoughts, stopped in its tracks, 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 keen listening. I spelled out my code. There was no interruption. A lovely song rang out. Under night's fading morning moonlight, a fox and the soul of a woman await the dawn. Long lasting ancient echoes resound, weaving change for the best outcome in the round. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. And next we have Nick Mesa. Hi, I didn't write 
I got published in a book and we had a book on the weekend. Come on, Fall, come up. And oh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Wurundjeri tribe, the, uh, those, the elders past, present and future. And here's my poem, it's called Love, a Mathematical Equation. Subtract out, out of lover while it's over. And when you have a lover multiplied by a lover, the answer is one lover. And if you have a lover plus a lover, then you have two lovers. Then if you add two lovers and a lover, you have a menage a trois or a cheater. And if you multiply two sets of lovers, it's an awesome foursome. Any additions, it's just an orgy. Now that you have lovers in the equation, you can drop the R from lover and all you're left with is love because love is all you need. And if you encounter any health problems, you can call the love ambulance. They can't help you with CPR. Your lover can administer EAR, the kiss of life, until you get to the love hospital where they can prescribe some sexual healing. And oh, baby, makes me feel so fine. Damn, this poet's quoting songs. You better watch out. You better not cry, you better not pout. I'm telling you why Cupid and Aphrodite join forces and your love will reach heavenly heights. And if the sun hides and eclipses the lovers, it's jealous because it it's the only one that wants to shine and let the sun soak and drool and give it the middle finger and sing in the sunshine of your love. Take a news presenter with a V-neck top which flows to her cleavage and I'm just high on the world. Come on, take a low ride with me, girl, on the tunnel of love. And if that's if that's the case, this can be drawn. Imagine a parabola intersecting a circle. That's a sexual math equation. A mathematician will write a formula, love on a graph, a poet will make you feel a mathematical love equation. Thank you. I'm from Melbourne, Australia, if I forgot to mention. Thank you, Mick. Thank you so much. And next we have Max Vandersteen, followed by Lenora Good. Hi, me, mateys. I hope you all be well today. <laughs> I'm also coming, like from Claire, uh, Claire Kelly, I also come from Edmonton, in, in Alberta, Canada. And I uh, like to mentioned about the theme of the apocalypse of, um, of the coming of apocalypse of the world. To, so um, the poems I want to read today are both dealing with that, um, following my tradition of writing petrol poetics. First one is called Addiction. The needle slides slowly in as the rig drills deep to draw the blackened blood of ancient marine life from the vein that runs fathoms under the crust plunging and pulling, penetrating through layers of interred history, the pump jack action continues to suck up the virulent serum from ancient embedded pockets of carbonized primitive life forms. The phyla and the families of ferns, crustaceans, and pre-Cro-Magnon marine organisms transformed through the processes of pressure and decay. Today, the buried dry seabeds reliquified through eons and epochs, are evacuated again as petroleum is percolated persistently to the surface. Pray for predatory pipelines, a new sustenance for habitual dependence on oil field opiates and carboniferous derivatives of petrochemical narcotics. This new phylogenetic process reveals a pockmarked planet which exhibits countless scars and scabs of an addiction to bitumen. Um, the second poem I want to read is uh, called We Still Write the Story. We, fill, we still fill the skies with our fogs of smog, even until the teardrops that respond, falling from leaden charcoal colored clouds, tragically with the planet correspond. With similar lists of chemical mists, despoiling and distorting the features of a desecrated terrestrial face. Contaminating too all Earth's creatures dwelling within the uncleanly confines of mountains and forests, shores and oceans, 
infiltrated by phosphates and plastics and permeated with oil-laced potions. We still fill coffers of capitalists driven to advance their profit margins who concern themselves not with abatement nor the influence of hydrocarbons and petrochemicals that propel distress. Environmental consequence of pollution, indiscriminate mining, clear cutting, or the future of Earth's evolution. Unlike the vaults of affluent plutocrats, the wealth of nature is exhaustible. The bitter reality is that to continue this course is implausible. We still fill the role of the Earth's landlords, wholly responsible to maintain it. We still fill the role of Earth's stewards, totally accountable to sustain it. We, the artists of the planet's palette, discolor blue skies, green fields, and clear seas with tinctures, undertones, and sullen shades which evolve out of our activities. We, the authors of our Earth's history, determine the climatic conclusion, but still find our ways to gamble with fate and ignore the nature of preclusion. If we still fill our souls with love for creation, how will we fulfill our obligation? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Max. And next we have Lenora Good. Can you hear me okay? Uh, this is from my book, the Bride's Gate and Other Assorted Writings, A Modern Eclectic Reader for Modern Eclectic Readers. It's a collection of poetry, short stories, and short memoirs. This is a poem. Mary Oliver wants to die when it's raining. Mary Oliver wants to die when it's raining. A long, slow rain, a kind that may never end like I used to imagine on Venus until science dissolved that dream in a cloud of sulfuric acid. I think I want to die in the spring when the sun is light and warm, when the birds are loud and raucous and the trees outside my window burst with new life as mine fades. Oh, unless I die in summer when starving baby birds screech and Gossipy mosquitoes annoy with their whiny, high-pitched stories, and children run, shriek with laughter through sprinklers outside my window when night comes, soft as my lover's caress. I thought I want to die in autumn. To watch the trees outside my window go from green to gold, to red to bare, hear footsteps crunch dry leaves randomly scattered on the ground, and stars are so bright, sleep is hard to come by. No, no, wait, I think I want to die in winter. Quiet winter, sparkling white with snow, short days, long nights, naked trees outside my window with playful squirrels searching the diamonds of sun on snow for seeds and finding only tangible cold. Quiet. Winter, I'll slip away, be gone before anyone sees, ride the back of Brother Owl into the cold and sparkling night. No, I don't suppose it matters. I will die when death calls for me and not a day sooner. And his timing will be perfect as long as it's next season. After Marengo by Mary Oliver. Thank you so much, Lenora. And joining us next is Scott Norman Rosenthal. Please remind us where you're- I'm in exile up in Northeastern Vermont. One land which uh, archeology span has indicated has changed hands countless times. Countless times. This is the lost enchanter who calls honey. And it's bouquets with strength, heady, coursing the veins like wine. As I dined in the mornings and in the long afternoons in my house with the windows open, 
now that the sun is like an old harlot or a false friend too late found out. Now the rooster's crow becomes bees buzzing in my dreams. The people and the houses, the lamplit streets are no less alien than I. The whole surface of the earth is foreign and the nighted roads will not lead me home. And this one, because witchcraft was mentioned, I'm going to recite this one. This is uh, the Malinger goes to the movies. You're sitting there, it's getting harder to breathe. It seems like a little man, like a gnome, has crept up the back of your seat and dropped a net into your skull, over your brain. You glance at the woman sitting next to you and she isn't there. You turn back to the screen and it seems unreal, like a bad film. Are you in a theater at all? Are you in a room filled with water? Are there any people here? Show's over. You're out in the parking lot, wondering how to get home. Mm. Mm. We, we should remember that um, people's medicine, which is now referred to as alternative medicine, which is more soundly based in biology than so-called standard medicine, um, was one of the motives for the witch trials. Even though there, was, there were crossovers, but uh, physicians got themselves involved. Uh, you know, getting the competition executed is quite a way of building up your own practice. And it's still going on today, folks. Check it out. Thank you. Thank you, Scott Norman Rosenthal. I'm moving us along. I've just added a few more readers just because we had so, so we'll be going just a little over 1.30. And next we have Christopher T. George followed by Don Krieger. Yeah, and I'd like to do the share screen if I possibly could. Go ahead, go right um, ahead. Turn my glasses on. Here we go. Um, Trying to do the share screen. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I'm a, um, a poet, but I'm also a historian. So I very much appreciated Cindy's uh, performance about the uh, Salem witch trials. Uh, one of the things that people should know about the witch trials is that people... Uh, the women that were killed were hanged rather than burned. Most people think that uh, they were burned. I'm also going to be talking about this man, uh, Fred, Frederick Bailey Deeming, uh, who was a serial killer who was uh, hung out in or hanged out in Australia. And here he is. He was a serial killer, a bigamist, swindler, con man, all round evil man. He went by quite a number of alternative names, Baron Swanston, Harry Lawson, Albert Oliver Williams, Frederick Bruin, and Frederick Dawson. And he killed his family in Rain Hill, Lancashire, not far from Liverpool, and then killed another wife out in Melbourne, Australia. And that's when he finally uh, got, hit, got uh, arrested. And this is a house uh, in Windsor, Melbourne, uh, where he killed uh, that final woman, uh, Emily Mather, as she was before she married him. And uh, he, married, he murdered his wife, Emily, in a rented house on Andrew Street, 57 Andrew Street, December the 25th, 1891. Merry Christmas. Deeming is believed by many to have been Jack the Ripper, but was he? Uh, and this shows a, a period picture of Emily Mather. Uh, and he was uh, arrested in Southern Cross, Western Australia, in the gold fields. And this is me speaking about uh, Deeming in Liverpool in 2017, last time I was over there. And um, I'd like you to see this is his family, all under age nine, 
and his 39-year-old uh, wife, Marie. And uh, look at the uh, picture at the bottom left. That was the Mother uh, News Agent shop. And it's still standing today. It's now what they call in the UK a beauty shop or a hair salon. And opposite is the Victoria Hotel, where the inquest on Deeming's family uh, was held. And this shows the uh, coroner, Samuel Brighouse. And it so happens that um, Samuel Brighouse was still a, uh, a coroner in 1932 and up till 1940, when he was named Sir Samuel Brighouse. And he, he presided over the uh, inquest on my uncle, Edward Point and George, who was my father's elder brother, who was killed in a mo motorcycle accident. And this is Rainhill Sanitarium, uh, the county lunatic asylum. And uh, growing up in Liverpool, I knew the name Rainhill because people would say, you're crazy, you are. You're going to be sent to Rain Hill. And so that's how I knew the name very early on. And, of course, the Whitechapel murders, the canonical five, were all killed in 1888. And it's believed that uh, Deeming was in South Africa at that time. The other thing about it is that the, uh, the women who were killed, who were mostly prostitutes, were killed on the open street or in a court or in one instance in a room. Uh, and that's not what Deeming did. He hid the bodies of his victims. This is Annie Chapman killed September the 8th, 29 Hanbury Street. Uh, and one woman, uh, Catherine Eddowes, her kidney was removed. And there was this letter received that was sent to George Lusk president of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee. Mr. Lusk, sir, I send you half the kidney I took from one woman, preserved it for you. To the piece I fried and ate, it was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out if you only wait a while longer. Catch me when you can, Mr. Lusk. And this is the scene at uh, 30 Miller's Court, Smittlefield. Uh, where Mary Jane Kelly was killed on that bed and much dis disfigured. So was Deeming Jack the Ripper? As I say, I don't think so, uh, although there were a number of people who claimed that he was the Ripper, even if he wasn't in uh, England at the right time. He allegedly did confess to killing the last two Ripper victims. So uh, in my research, I relied partly on this book, uh, The Scarlet Thread, Australia's Jack the Ripper, A True Crime Story by Morris Gervich and Christopher Ray. And as some of you may know, the present FBI director is Christopher Ray, not the same guy. These two guys are both Australians. Okay. And more recently, I've been advising this gentleman, Gary Linnell, uh, who's just published this book, The Devil's Work, and as you can see, emblazoned on the front of the book, it says, how Australia hunted and hanged the serial killer who shocked the world, Jack the Ripper. And this is Melbourne Prison, where uh, Frederick Bailey Deeming finally met his end. And the night before, Deeming doomed retribution overtakes the guilty. And you can see his young family there on the left and Emily Mather uh, both looking on as uh, he undergoes this terrible night. And here he is uh, being hanged in Melbourne jail, May 23rd, 1892. And that's his death mask and the cast of his hand uh, from the State Library of Victoria, Australia. Thank you, Christopher. I'm going yeah. to have to, I see you have the epilogue there. Um, feel free to post, feel free to post, um, you know, more. I just, I need to move the reading along a little bit. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Don, you're up next. Thank you, Sandy. 
Thank you, everyone. I just want to give a shout out to Ancha Sten and Betty Gilmore from Italy and, and Isaac Cohn from Israel, Attractive Fahey from Ireland, I believe, and so many others. Thank you for coming. October 27, 2018, Shabbos morning. Someone opened fire at the Tree of Life synagogue. Three days later, the first of the murdered were buried. One was husband to my coworker and friend. Unveiling. 11 lives taken at the Tree of Life, hours later and miles away, our writing workshop canceled, our chance for defiance, however small, gone. I waited at the funeral with hundreds to pass security, newsboys on the street asking with their cameras, who is afraid? I watched her halting walk to his grave, reluctant like a child. I followed like a child with a shovel full of earth to cover him. I listened to the learned seeking meaning, hundreds crowded into the Beth Shalom basement, police in armor at the entrance. When the doors locked behind us, I noticed the dampness and a draft on my bare neck. Today was 11 months, hundreds standing witness in the warmth beneath the trees. I still live, so I was there. I wonder though, would we have canceled our workshop for a drive-by at a playground? Thank you so much, Don. And we've got our four final readers. So I, I added a few extra folks, I'm, uh, it's, we have folks from everywhere. So uh, please, you know, up to three minutes if you can. Uh, I mean, uh, only up to three minutes. And thank you. Mary Ellen Talley is next. Hello from Seattle, Washington. Um, for those of you who are heard Claire Kelly read at her open mic, you'll recognize this title is hers, or we imagined it. Attack of the Killer Tupperware. And it's palindrome, so it's forward and backward. In my cupboard, after 50 years of marriage, see the mismatched lids of burping bowls. Everyone's gift at my wedding shower, because Aunt Ella's daughter told sold Tupperware including lettuce keeper, jello mold, and canister set. It took years for these to escape the confines of my kitchen, including lettuce keeper, jello mold, and canister set. Because Aunt Ella's daughter sold Tupperware, everyone's gift at my wedding shower. See the mismatched lids of burping bowls, in my cupboard after 50 years of marriage. Thank you. Thank you, brilliant, I love it. Hats off. <laughs> and next, welcome to Isaac Cohen. Thank you for being with us today. Yes. There you go. Uh, thank you, Sandra. And uh, hello to all my friends, Don and uh, all of my friends. Uh, my son, Isaac Cohen, the muses, son. The old, I close my eyes. I work in the field of flowers and nymphs. The old in the white bed, few muses find out 
secret in my brain's labyrinth. The all the muses sing and with wire connect the flowing voices of the beautiful sights of Mexico. My art rejoices at the sight of the pictures. Come unto the capital of Israel, Jerusalem of peace. And uh, now uh, the two the Cohen, love. We were reading poetry. The rain caressed the paper. How marvelous the minute we are flying over the small world. The soul wanders freely. We bloom in the world without change. And uh, the, the, uh, the last, uh, the last, where, where, where is uh, The last, as a coin. The perfume of the love. The world that you watch with your earth bloomed. How marvelous is the alchemist play in miserable world. I stay with you and the butterflies showered nectar on the bodies, unite the creation. Thank you, Isaac Cohen, Israel, and uh, thank you, Sandra, and thank you, Don, Angie, and all my friends in the world, and. Thank you so much, you. Isaac Cohen, joining you. us for the first time. What we'll return again yes. many times. Yes. Beautiful. Our yes. final readers today are Anshi Stein and Betty, followed by Betty Gilmore, will be last today. Welcome. Good Thank evening. You. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here you. in Italy, northern Italy, and it's a real foggy, dark night. So it's just the right situation. And Masila read a poem where a woman transformed into a ghost. I will read a poem where a woman transforms into a bird. It's grotesque this hard clash of familiar and bizarre, disregarding any classical rule. It seems to have nothing to do with reality. In the place of pillars, fragile straws grow freely into space. My canopy a facade made of perforated mesh <clears throat> and on the ridge of my body, thin stalks and tendrils metamorphose into figures with animal heads. Sitting on half a body, will people look at me with fear in their eyes? A hybrid? Do such things exist? Yes, they do. They do in a world of alterity and change. The grotesque elevated into the aesthetics, a fundamental experience. Every artist should devour this. Looking at the sky 
requires concentration. Suing white feathers on your back requires strength. To become a bird requires constant working physically and mentally. Let's bring the grotesque beyond the thorny border of our poetry world. Thank you. Ah, it is so worth a few of the extra moments to hear all these, these wonderful poems. Thank you so, so much. And our final reader for our yes. spectacular, spectacular <laughs> Betty Gilmore. Welcome, okay. Betty. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. It's such a wonderful reading. I wrote it's so entertaining, unusually entertaining, never boring. And the poets are great. You know, I'm taking things back from them. I really want to compliment all of them. And I wrote this poem. I'm always the last minute student who didn't. So I wrote it purposely for this um, session. And I wrote it because it, I remembered an experience that I actually had. So it's called uh, Halloween at the Mental Hospital. <laughs> and Halloween at the uh, Brackets Mental Hospital. The hospital was mental, but at first glance, I never could tell who was supposed to be insane and who was not supposed to be, and who just happened to be there like me. On one Halloween, when the patients were given extra pills and seemed unusually serene, a little like zombies, dragging their feet and hardly moving their arms. They barely seemed to notice the monsters roaming the halls or the witches and vampires that carried their food on trays like the others in simple white uniforms had always done before. But I wondered if the patients had seen the mask before behind the tidy uniforms and the orderly decor. And though the difference was hard to see between sanity and insanity, as for the patients, the only day that seemed normal was Halloween at the hospital. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for writing that poem specifically. It was for you. <laughs> today. I so appreciate you, Betty Gilmore, coming to Cultivating Voices today, as well as all the voices that we heard today. What, what an absolute uh, cavalcade of poetry, a, a, spec a yeah. spectacular rendering of the of the edges of things today brought from light to dark dark to light and everything in between we began with the salem witch trials of cindy veach we also heard our from our other feature the beginning, Claire Kelly joining us with her renderings from her book, Another Final Girl, about the women in horror films, and so many other prismatic renderings of what it means to embody the spirit brought today. I thank you all for your costumes from around the world, literally. We have folks here from New Zealand, Australia, Israel, uh, Italy, the UK, Canada, the US. What a great, great joining together. Of, and, and Ireland, of course, and a, a wonderful 
coming together of spirits today. Uh, very, very quickly, I know we went a little over, so I will just say what I say at the end of every reading is that on every day, but on Halloween in particular, our humanity depends on our deepest of listening to one another. So thank you for your spirits today, this evening, and I wish you that you wake in the morning, <laughs> that you wake in the morning. Next week, we will come back with another live open mic to open November with the theme of waves. Many, many ways to think of waves. So please join us. That uh, there is some time shifts coming up as there were for a number of you today. You've been, you're dealing with daylight savings time. Over in the States, we're dealing with daylight savings time. Check your time zones. We will see you again. Thank Next. you so much, Sandra. Be well out there. Be well Thank out everybody. there. Everybody, yeah. Good night.